but there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most credible voice in true crime. If we go back to that opening credit from Simon Sharma in The Power of Art, you hear him talking about Van Gogh's legacy. And Van Gogh's legacy was something Van Gogh himself was working on. He was trying to build a legacy, he didn't realize he'd already kind of built a legacy at the time anyway at the time of Albert Aurier's um, review of his work. Albert Aurier was also kind of talking about the idea of a legacy in terms of um, what he'd inherited from the Dutch tradition. In this episode, I want to take you through what may feel like familiar territory, but I want to take you through it very lightly. So I want to take you through um, the contradiction that exists to the present day between how a large portion of those who are familiar with Van Gogh see him and how a small but growing proportion see him. Now there are various ways of having this discussion. There's the dry art history lesson, um, there's the, you know, the, the reporting of facts and so on. I'm going to do it quite briefly and I'm going to do it in quite a simple and um, I guess unscientific way. Don't worry, <laughs> the science will come, but what, we, what we're going to do here is we're going to juxtapose two movies which are basically just two interpretations. One a fairly old um, and original interpretation and the other a modern um, reincarnation in a way of the Van Gogh story. And so those two stories are, that I'm going to juxtapose are Lust for Life and At Eternity's Gate. Now, don't laugh, but the irony is that the story that calls itself Lust for Life is about someone who is extremely troubled and um, ultimately very lonely and very miserable. So the story that is called Lust for Life should really be called at eternity's gate and if you look at the painting that the 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 movie drew its name from it's kind of a a figure of a um, sort of a blue collar worker a miner or a just sort of, sort of a peasant sort of guy um, sitting on his chair in front of a, a fire it's something that Van Gogh painted and sketched in various iterations but in any event it was often the same sort of thing this this image of despair and um, you would think that if Van Gogh himself felt this kind of despair that there would be hundreds of, of images like this, hum hundreds of portraits like this of despair and especially in the last months of his life when they aren't. So the irony is At Eternity's Gate is about a Van Gogh that's not suicidal and he is viscerally connected to the electric environment he finds himself in. He's, he's literally um, plugged into the, the radiance of the world and he's sort of filled up. And so, if anything, the movie At Eternity's Gate should be called Lust for Life. Because we see so many scenes where Willem Dafoe is sort of channeling the divine spirit in things and in nature, he's sort of kind of at one with his world. Um, you know, when the wind blows, he's in the middle of the, those field of rushes and he's feeling the rush of life. He's feeling the rush of life that Simon Sharma talks about and he's trying to convey that onto the canvas. And so the, the movie that's called At Eternity's Gate should be called Lust for Life. And the movie Lust for Life should be called At Eternity's Gate just because 
Lust for Life, the, the movie, is filled with um, teeth grinding, you know, gnashing of teeth and, and um, these moments of anguish and agony, which you don't see in At Eternity's Gate. So I'm going to take you back to Martin Bailey, the, the art expert at, at Bonhams, which is an art dealership in London, auction house in London. And we're going to get his expert view on the discord between these two films. So don't take my word for it. Let's take the art expert's word for it, okay? And so what Martin Bailey is saying in this particular article in the art newspaper, remember we were talking about um, how he was referring to Kirk Douglas's portrayal, but he then jumps to um, a, a more modern uh, version of it, which is Julian Schnabel's At Eternity's Gate, which came out in 2018. And then this is what he wrote. He wrote, at the time of its launch, Schnabel, that's the director, commented, I loved Lust for Life when I was a child, but it's got every cliche. It's kind of the opposite of the film we made. And what he's saying through that statement is that Lust for Life was almost like a fairy tale, which he um, enjoyed as a child. And so there was like a childlike faith in the film. But when he grew up and he became a film director, he kind of looked back on that film and thought it was kind of camp and kind of cliched and that it wasn't really resonating with truth. It was resonating kind of with cliches. And I love the way that he says it's kind of the opposite of the film we made. So what he's literally saying there is the one film that meant so much to him as a child um, didn't really inform the film that he made that that he felt as an adult was the better, more authentic version of the Van Gogh story. And so he's literally saying they were, they're, they're like opposites. And so in what way were they like opposites? And then what Martin Bailey says is, although At Eternity's Gates, Gate avoids many of Lust for Life's embellishments, what he's talking about there is he's saying Lust for Life was dram over dramatizing certain things, overstating certain things, um, making certain depictions too colorful and too sort of fruity, fruit like a fruitcake, right? So at Eternity's Gate's more subdued, but it's also more cerebral, okay? And it's easy to be to embellish Van Gogh because he's such a colorful character. I mean, you would think anything subdued would be incompatible with Van Gogh, but yet Van Gogh was a subdued fellow in the sense that he was in a, a madhouse. He was he was alone a lot. Um, painting is a quiet process. I mean, even though his paintings are are loud and and noisy with. Um, with with a vigor that it, that goes into them, painting itself certainly isn't um, you know like writing. You are sitting down or standing, and it's a static process. Everything is going on in the mind for sure, but there is a, an element of it that is subdued, and you can have a spiritual experience when you are in like a quiet state, right? And um, anyway, what Martin Bailey says is Schnabel has introduced new myths. So he's saying although there, there are embellishments in, in Lust for Life, in other words, inaccuracies, Schnabel has introduced new myths as well. In other words, Martin Bailey is kind of saying both films have sort of not got it right. They haven't nailed Van Gogh, basically. And I, I agree with that. Although I don't really agree that if Martin Bailey made a film, he would get it right either. <laughs> and I'm sure if he's listening to this, he would find that very arrogant and very, I don't know, but he might, maybe he would chuckle at that. But in any event, in, in Martin Bailey's mind, um, some of the, the myths that Schnabel introduced 
included accepting a fake sketchbook of Al's drawings. And this is the interesting one, presenting the artist's death as murder, not suicide. So I agree with him on the first point. I, th there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of fake Van Goghs around. There's, there, there are fake sketches, there are fake paintings. I think even the, the pistol that, that was recently sold is a fake. Or it's not the pistol that was used. So there's this whole cottage industry around Van Gogh fakes, and that's why I say if you're interested in true crime, there is a whole, um, like an endless line of things to investigate because they, they are constantly fakes that are being, or uh, how can I put it, disputed artworks that are that are that are now being sort of um, re. evaluated and then just determined to be authentic and of course they then instantly uh, become worth millions so basically if you have a disputed sketch it's kind of worth nothing but if it becomes a Van Gogh it's suddenly worth possibly tens of millions of dollars and um, there's quite an incentive in 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 um, for an expert in deciding that something is not a fake right and so they even because Van Gogh wrote so many letters, he wrote hundreds of letters, and he also made quite a lot of sketches while he was writing those letters, that is a, a, um, an incredibly ripe field for um, faking, um, you know, letters and sketches that, that he didn't write. And, and I'm going to take you through some of that. Um, it's really interesting how they determine... Um, there are some things that they have absolutely said, okay, this is definitely a fake. But what is interesting is, and just bear with me for a moment, um, the actual notes that he wrote in his diary, that paper is kind of yellowed, right? It's kind of like a dark color, right? And now you, you would think that if something is genuine, it would also be that dark color. Right, so, so someone comes along and, and they show you a page and it's, it's a similar sort of yellowed color as the, the paper of the diary. <clears throat> You're also going to say, yeah, well, you know, the color is right. But if you dig a little bit deeper and you scratch beneath the surface, it turns out the original color of that paper is too dark. I actually can't remember if it's the, the, the ink as well, because the ink also changed color. In any event, when they reverse engineered these um, these artifacts and they went to check the kind of materials, they found that the paper and the ink weren't the same as what Van Gogh used. And that's how they determined it was a fake. Even though they, at face value, kind of looked the same. So I agree with that aspect from Martin Bailey. I don't agree that... Um, the artist's death was, um, you know, the, the presenting of the artist's death as murder is a myth. I don't think that is a myth. I think the suicide is a myth, but there are some very compelling reasons that experts would believe that. But, you know, if you're not, if you don't understand true crime, you're not going to understand it if you haven't investigated that this aspect as a um, kind of a true crime professional. You're not going to know. And to be absolutely explicit, in *At Eternity's Gate*, Vincent's death isn't really depicted as murder. It's depicted as an accidental shooting. It's depicted in the same way as Knife and Smith have um, suggested it. So that is recent research, and At Eternity's Gate based their movie on this recent research. So it's not baseless, but it's nevertheless an accidental death, which I don't believe is the case either. So let me be clear. Just on this single point, there are three different views. There is Martin Bailey's view that it's suicide. There is... Schnabel's view, Julian Schnabel's view, that it's that corresponds to 
Van Gogh the life from Knife and Smith that it was an accidental shooting and then there's the true crime rocket science version that it was murder and not only murder it's murder with a motive and there's a murderer it's not that Van Gogh was shot by accident somebody wanted to murder him and murdered him or somebody wanted to shoot him and shoot him they did and he died Lust for Life nevertheless is a very important film because it is a film that established not only Kirk Douglas's legend but also the legend of Vincent van Gogh and so a lot of that has had to be undone but it's had you know at least 70 years to or, or, you know around about you know half a century to ingrain itself in in the public imagination in generations of people because it seemed it seemed to be historical Martin Bailey talks about Lust for Life being the first dramatized production and in color ever of Van Gogh. And it, it found a ripe population in, in, in um, America that was trying to come out of its own depression, just trying to come out of the, the, the ravages of the Second World War. So a lot of what Van Gogh was going through, people wanted to, um, you know, the, it, it sort of empathized with their condition. The suffering was something that they um, could sympathize with. And what Van Gogh kind of pretended was that one could transcend all of this hardship with kind of hard work and, you know, ultimately um, there would be a legacy at the end of it, and there was. Martin Bailey refers to the first film ever on Van Gogh was made by a French director in black and white in 1948, and then Lust for Life followed about eight years later. So that was kind of when all of this happened was was just after the the Second World War. So so that was the the a sort of cataclysm, the darkness that had enveloped the world in which this story um, was kind of born. And, and, and it was something people needed in a way, that they needed to feel their suffering acknowledged, that they just, just came out of. And, you know, just persist, just keep working. And so after Lust for Life, um, there was a little bit of a gap, but then from the 70s onwards, there was a continuous stream of films. And kind of by then, his, his legend was kind of established. And somebody said that I think there have been 17 movies made about Van Gogh. That's a lot. One of the most recent is the animated version, Loving Vincent, which I think is an excellent um, documentary. And it's, it's kind of dramatized like a true crime investigation. It was actually that dramatization that led me to write, well, well to investigate and then write um, The Murder of Vincent van Gogh. So just to give you some background, I had just finished writing a book called Slaughter, which is one of my longest books, one of my most exhausting books, I think one of my best efforts as well. But it was while recovering from that book and kind of resting that I, I started um, watching Van Gogh documentaries just to unwind and you know do something that I enjoyed away from true crime. Little did I know that when I watched Loving Vincent, I was I was kind of watching an investigation, a factual investigation into his life, but beautifully animated, and that then kind of dumped me into into writing another book. I didn't intend to write a book after slaughter in that period of, of, of kind of just trying to recover my wits. But anyway, in that period, I watched this film and that led me to write um, The Murder of Vincent van Gogh. So I want to encourage you guys to also watch it if you can. Through the course of between now and um, July this year, I'm going to be taking you through a lot of the popular documentaries. There are many and many very good ones. Um, Andy Serkis, the, the, the fellow who played Gollum, um, he depicted Van Gogh. Benedict Cumberbatch, and as we know, Kirk Douglas, Willem Dafoe, and others. But anyway, we're going to go through some of these depictions, 
in a lot more detail in these documentaries to, to get an even firmer grip on who we're talking about. We're going to look at what they got right and what they didn't. So in a previous episode, I mentioned how Martin Bailey spoke about lust for life, adding to the mythology um, where Douglas presented Van Gogh as highly strung and tormented and impulsive and filled with pent up emotions. We, we kind of dealt with that in a previous episode, but I, I just want to emphasize that is the film kind of, the, the mythology of Lust for Life, as much as it formed people's ideas of Van Gogh, it was mostly in this idea of his character, of this really troubled artist, as this um, icon of um, the mad genius. And that, that's kind of, that's the legacy Lust for Life kind of created, and it's a false legacy. And Martin Bailey emphasizes that the definitive edition of Van Gogh's letters shows that Van Gogh wasn't like that. Even though Irving Stone claimed that his book was um, derived from the character and the substance of Van Gogh, it kind of wasn't. It was embellished. It was The book even was kind of a dramatized version of what was in the letters. And so, yeah, you've got an art expert, Martin Bailey, rightly saying that actually the letters show that Van Gogh was a lot more thoughtful and he was a very determined guy. He wasn't as unstable and erratic as he's been depicted in, in, in films. But you're only going to know what I'm talking about and what Martin Bailey is talking about when we go through some of these letters that Van Gogh wrote and then get that sense from him of who he was. And there's not little paragraphs here and there, they're long letters. I mean, the, the, the point is made over and over again of how thoughtful and clear-minded and determined he is to, to do what he wants to do. And so tomorrow I'm going to be dealing with the letter he wrote to his mother, talking about this review he got from Albert Aurier. And tomorrow is the 19th of February, and um, that is 130 years ago to the day that he wrote that letter. If you're interested in my research on that subject, check out The Murder of Vincent van Gogh. It's available on Kindle. I do recommend you read it on Kindle because there are a lot of links to photos and news stories, but it's also available on paperback if you're interested. Thank you for listening and I'll see you again tomorrow.